Math is the language that we use to describe the laws of nature as physicists, and there's no way around it. If you want to understand physics, you're going to have to learn a lot of math. And if I had to pick one formula that's the most important for understanding physics, it would be this one, Taylor's formula. It shows up in virtually everything we do in physics. And in this video, I want to explain how it works and give you a few examples of its importance in different corners of physics. You probably learned this theorem before if you've taken a calculus class, though you might not have written it in this nice and compact notation. I'll show you that it's equivalent to the Taylor series that lets us expand any smooth function in powers of x. In the first half of the video, I'm going to explain where this incredibly important formula comes from and what it means. And then in the second half, I'll tell you about three applications in physics where it shows up. Though again, you'd be hard pressed to find a chapter of any physics textbook where it's not applied. Number one, we'll look at how the Taylor series enables us to understand the complicated equations we often need to solve in physics by studying a limit where the equations simplify. Second, I'll show you how Einstein's E equals mc squared, or actually his more general formula for the energy of a relativistic particle of mass m and momentum p, correctly reproduces the more familiar kinetic energy, one half mv squared, for particles that aren't moving too close to the speed of light, and also how that same Taylor series leads to the fine structure of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And third, we'll look at how Taylor's formula leads directly to the definition of the momentum operator in quantum mechanics. I'm not assuming you've learned much about relativity or quantum mechanics before, by the way. The point is just to see some of the different ways that Taylor's formula shows up in different areas of physics. So let's start with the math and understand what this formula is all about. Say we have some function f of x. Here's a random example. It looks really complicated, but instead of trying to understand the whole complicated function at once, let's zoom in and look at it in a smaller region where it's a lot simpler. Take this point here, for example, and let's choose our origin so that this point is sitting at x equals zero. So the height of the function there is f of zero. Imagine that this curve is the shape of a treacherous mountain, and you're an intrepid explorer plotting out its map. You're high up in the air, and it's very foggy, so you can't see very far in either direction. You just need to carefully walk along the mountain and record its shape using an altimeter that measures your height above the ground, starting from this point, x equals zero. Initially, all you can say is that your starting height is f of zero. For all you know, the whole mountain might just be a flat, horizontal line at this height. Then, when you try to write down in your field journal a function that describes the height of the mountain, your first guess is just f of x equals f of zero, a horizontal line at your starting height. But now you take a little hop to the right, and you discover that the height of the mountain has changed, so it's not actually a horizontal line. Instead, as far as you can tell now, it looks like a line that's sloped at an angle where the slope is given by the first derivative of f at x equals zero. Now, your new best guess for the height function is the equation of this sloped line, f of x equals f of zero plus f prime of zero times x. But now you take another hop, and you discover that the curve isn't a straight line after all. Instead, it starts to deflect away from a line like a parabola. So now you expect there's a better approximation to the function like this, with an x squared term and some coefficient a in front of it. But at this point, you start to think to yourself that you might be able to get an even better description of the function over a wider range by including many more powers of x, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. So you stop exploring for a moment and sit down to do some math. You want to express this function f as a sum of powers of x with some coefficients, c0, c1, c2, and so on. The question is how to pick these numbers so that this series does a good job of matching up with f. Well, we've already seen what the first couple of coefficients are. When we plug in x equals zero, everything except the first term disappears, and we get f of zero equals c zero. So that first number in the series is just the value of the function at our starting point, x equals zero. As for the next one, c1x and everything after it disappears when we plug in x equals zero. But what if we take the derivative first? Remembering the rule that to take the derivative of x to the n, we bring the power down out front and then reduce the exponent by one we get f prime of x equals c1 plus 2c2 times x plus 3c3 x squared plus dot dot dot. Now when we plug in x equals zero, the c1 term survives. f prime of zero equals c1. So again, like we already knew, we should set this first coefficient c1 to be the derivative of f at x equals zero. But now we've got the idea. If we take the derivative again, we get f double prime of x equals 2c2 plus 3 times 2 c3x and so on 
And so when we plug in x equals zero, we learn that f double prime of zero equals two C2. Then we should choose C2 to be half the second derivative of f at x equals zero. And on and on it goes. Hopefully you see the pattern. For the x to the n term in the sum, we need to take the derivative n times until this is the only term that's around when we plug in x equals zero. Each derivative brings down a power, first n, then n minus one, n minus two, and so on, all the way down to three, two, one. In other words, the nth derivative is n factorial times cn. So the nth coefficient is one over n factorial times the nth derivative of f evaluated at x equals zero. For this x cubed term, for example, we get one over three factorial, which is one sixth, times the third derivative of f at zero. By the way, I go through all this step by step in the notes, which you can get at the link in the description to dig through all the details here after you've watched. Now we're in business. We've written an approximation for our function f as a sum of powers of x. This is the Taylor series for f. When x is tiny, so that we're close to the starting point here, each higher power of x is an even tinier number than the one that came before it. And so we already get a good approximation by keeping just the first few terms in the series. The farther away we venture from x equals zero, the more terms we need to include in the series in order to get a good description of the function. But now that we have the general formula for the coefficients, we can include as many terms as we like. Here's what it looks like for this function as we make the total number of terms bigger and bigger. You can see that the series approximation matches the curve better and better as n gets large. And here's the kicker. When we include all the terms by summing up the infinite series over all powers of x, we actually reproduce the exact function that we started with, as long as it was smooth and well-behaved and the series converges. This is truly remarkable. It says that if we know all the derivatives of a smooth function at a single point, we can reconstruct the rest of the function everywhere else. Let's do some examples. How about f of x equals sine of x? Let's write down its Taylor series around x equals zero. We just need to know what its derivatives are at that point. So let's make a little table. Sine of x passes through the origin, so we start off with f of zero equals zero. Zero factorial is defined to be one, by the way, and so this first term in the Taylor series is just zero. Next up, we need the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. Now when we plug in x equals zero, we get cosine of zero, which is one. And so the first interesting term in the Taylor series is just x, a straight line through the origin with slope one. That's already a very good approximation to sine of x when x is a small number. And so we use the approximation sine of x equals x often in physics. But as x gets a little bigger, clearly the straight line isn't going to cut it anymore. So let's keep going. For the next term, we need the derivative of cosine of x, which is minus sine of x. But that vanishes again when x equals zero. And so the x squared term actually disappears. That's part of the reason the linear approximation was so good to begin with. Now for f triple prime of x, we need the derivative of minus sine and we get minus cosine. Then f triple prime of zero equals minus one. And so the cubic coefficient is minus one over three factorial. Let's do one more line. We want the derivative of minus cosine, which is sine. This vanishes again when we plug in x equals zero. And so there's no x to the four term in the series. We could keep going like this and take more derivatives. But notice that with the fourth derivative here, we've just gotten back to where we started with sine of x. So this same sequence of four derivatives is just going to repeat itself over and over again. Then we can just write down the whole series without any more work. The next term is x to the fifth over five factorial, followed by minus one over seven factorial x to the seventh, and plus one over nine factorial x to the nine, and so on. Here's what it looks like going up to x to the 29. You can see that it does a good job reproducing the sine curve right up to the edges of these four periods. Notice that only odd powers of x show up here in the Taylor series. That's because sine of x is an odd function. When you compare it on the right and left sides of the y-axis, it looks the same, except that it's been flipped over. In other words, sine of minus x equals minus sine of x. Odd powers of x share that property, but even powers don't. And that's why there are no even powers of x in the Taylor series for sine. Like I mentioned before, oftentimes in physics, we're not actually interested in the whole Taylor series. What we really want is a good approximation to a complicated function that makes a problem simpler to solve. I'll show you examples of what I mean in a minute. So in this case, we might stop with the first term and just apply the fact that sine of x is approximately equal to x when x is small. This is called the small angle approximation. And you may have run into it in your first physics class when you learned about the simple pendulum. The key point here is that when x is small, like say 
Then when we take larger powers of x in the successive terms in the Taylor series, they get even smaller. x cubed equals 0 0.001, x to the fifth equals 0 0.00001, and so on. Not to mention the effect of the huge factorials in the denominators. That's why we can ignore the higher order terms for small x and get a good approximation to our function just by keeping the leading term. Let's do one more quick example, f of x equals e to the x. This will be important in a moment for seeing the slickest way to write down Taylor's formula. This one's easy because the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x again. And when we plug in x equals zero, we get one. And the coefficients are one over n factorial. So we can just jump right to the Taylor series. e to the x equals one plus x plus one over two factorial x squared plus one over three factorial x cubed and so on. And once again, if x is tiny, then we can get a good approximation by stopping at the linear term. It's not quite as good as we had for sine of x though, because in that case, the x squared correction vanished. Now, before we get to the physics examples, the last thing I wanna do is show you a few convenient ways of writing Taylor's formula. Spelling out the whole sum like this obviously isn't very concise, but we can write the same thing much more compactly using sum notation. The sum over n of one over n factorial the nth derivative of f evaluated at zero times x to the n. This is the Taylor series for f of x expanded around x equals zero. But come to think of it, there was nothing special about x equals zero here. That's just where we happened to put the origin when we drew the graph of f of x. We could just as well write an expansion around any other point, call it x zero, say. Then the Taylor expansion of f around x zero is given by the sum of one over n factorial times the derivatives of f evaluated at that starting point, x zero times the powers of the distance from there, x minus x zero. For example, here's what we get with the first few terms of the Taylor series for this function expanded around this given point. Actually, there's another way of writing this expression that's often more useful. Let epsilon denote this quantity in parentheses, x minus x zero. It measures how far away you are from the starting point. So when epsilon is small, you're very close to x zero. And as it gets bigger, you get farther away. Then x is given by x zero plus epsilon and we can write the same expression like this. This way of writing things makes it really clear that we can think of the Taylor series as starting at the point x zero and then expanding out away from there by evaluating f at x zero plus epsilon in powers of the displacement. But this isn't even the slickest way to write the Taylor series, which is the formula I showed you at the very beginning of the video. To see how that works, we'll switch to the other notation for derivatives. So the nth derivative of f is obtained by applying d by dx to it n times or in other words, d by dx to the power n acting on f. Then we'll plug this into the Taylor series, which lets us write it like this. I went ahead and dropped the x zero subscript now because that was just a label that we don't need anymore. So far, this doesn't look like a huge simplification, but now let's drag that epsilon to the n to the left inside the parentheses. Now this looks really interesting. It says that if we want to know the value of our function f at a point that's shifted away from x by an amount epsilon, what we should do is take the function at the original point x and apply this special combination of derivatives to it. But hang on a second, that might look familiar. Remember from a minute ago that the Taylor series we found for e to the z was one plus z plus one over two factorial z squared plus one over three factorial z cubed plus dot dot dot. Or in some notation, the sum of one over n factorial z to the n. But that's exactly what this differential operator looks like, where z is this thing in parentheses epsilon d by dx. Then this big sum of derivatives is nothing but e to the epsilon d by dx. And so, at least formally, we can write f of x plus epsilon equals e to the epsilon d by dx acting on f of x. This is the most compact, convenient, and beautiful way of writing Taylor's formula. It neatly repackages the whole infinite sum over derivatives of f and powers of the displacement into a single operator, e to the epsilon d by dx, acting on the function. Just to make sure it's clear how this works, let's try applying it to a really simple function, f of x equals mx plus b. Obviously, the Taylor series for this one is gonna be really boring. It already is its own Taylor series. We expand out the exponential and get one plus epsilon times the first derivative plus one half epsilon squared times the second derivative and so on. And then all that acts on the function, mx plus b. When we multiply out the one, we just get back mx plus b. And when the first derivative term acts, we get epsilon m. As for that second derivative and everything else, all that disappears because when you take more than one derivative of a straight line, you get zero. So altogether, we've got mx plus b plus epsilon m. 
or equivalently m times x plus epsilon plus b, which is precisely f of x plus epsilon, just as expected. One last beautiful thing about this way of writing Taylor's formula before we get to the physics. It makes the generalization to the multivariable Taylor expansion really straightforward. Say we now have a function f of x, y, z. For example, this might be the potential energy function of a particle moving around in three-dimensional space. Then what's the Taylor expansion of this? The most direct way to approach it is to expand like before with one variable at a time. If we apply the Taylor expansion just in x, we get f of x, still with y plus epsilon y, z plus epsilon z, plus epsilon x d by dx of that, plus half epsilon x squared times the second derivative with respect to x, and so on. Where these are now partial derivatives because f is a function of more than one variable. All that means is that we take the derivative of f with respect to x like we normally would, treating the other variables y and z as constants. But now we have to do the same expansion over again in each of these terms for y and then again in each of those terms for z. It's a bit of a mess. But our exponential formula makes the whole thing incredibly simple. Let's write our vector equals x, y, z for the position vector, and epsilon vector equals epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z for the displacement vector. Then we're trying to Taylor expand f of r vector plus epsilon. All we need to do to generalize our original formula is to replace the epsilon d by dx in the exponent with the dot product between epsilon vector and the quote unquote vector of partial derivatives, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, which is usually denoted by this upside down triangle called del. And so this dot product just means epsilon x, d by dx, plus epsilon y, d by dy, plus epsilon z, d by dz. Then by combining the exponential formulas for the Taylor series in x, y, and z, we get this beautiful compact formula for the Taylor expansion in three or any number of variables. Okay, that's enough math. Now let's put it to work with part two, the physics. I promised to show you three applications. Number one, how to make the complicated equations that we often need to solve in physics simpler by studying special linearized limits. Number two, the non-relativistic limit of Einstein's energy formula and how it contributes to the fine structure of the hydrogen atom. And number three, the definition of the momentum operator in quantum mechanics. Let's go one by one. Again, you don't necessarily need to know anything going in about relativity or quantum mechanics. The point is just to get a taste of how Taylor's formula appears in several very different areas of physics. Starting with number one, making complicated problems simple. The basic procedure to solve a problem in classical mechanics is to write down all the forces on a particle and then add them up and write f equals ma and then solve this equation for the position of the particle as a function of time. That's easier said than done though, especially the last step, solving f equals ma, because for all but the simplest systems, this equation quickly becomes too hard to solve exactly. f equals ma is a differential equation, which just means that it contains derivatives of the function that you're trying to solve for. R of t in this case. And differential equations are much harder to solve than the algebraic equations that we all first learn about in middle school and high school. A simple example that I've told you about in a few past videos is the pendulum. When solving for the motion of a pendulum, the main force we're interested in is the component of gravity that points along the tangent direction to the circle where the particle is constrained to move. That's given by mg sine of theta, where theta is the angle that the pendulum makes with the vertical axis like I showed you in the very first video I posted here on the channel. Then the f equals ma equation for theta can be written, after a little simplifying, as the second derivative of theta with respect to time equals minus g over l sine of theta. Simple as this physical setup looks, this equation is already very complicated because of this factor of sine of theta. It makes it what we call a nonlinear differential equation, which can be very nasty to try to solve. On the other hand, when theta is small, you can picture a pendulum gently rocking back and forth like a grandfather clock. And that motion certainly doesn't seem very complicated. Is it possible then that we can simplify this equation when theta is relatively small? The Taylor series lets us do just that. Like we worked out before, the Taylor series for sine is theta minus one over three factorial theta cubed plus one over five factorial theta to the fifth plus dot dot dot. Then for tiny thetas, we can apply the small angle approximation like we saw before. Then this complicated f equals ma equation becomes vastly simpler. There's no sine theta factor here anymore, making this equation complicated and nonlinear. By applying the Taylor series, we've been able to linearize the differential equation. 
to turn it into a problem we can solve much more easily in the special case when the pendulum isn't too far away from equilibrium. This is just the equation of a simple harmonic oscillator now, like a mass on a spring. And the general solution is a sum of sines and cosines with angular frequency square root g over l. So the pendulum indeed rocks gently back and forth from side to side. If you've been watching my recent videos and all this looks familiar, it's no accident. I told you a few weeks ago about how the first thing we should do in any physics problem is expand the potential energy function around a stable equilibrium point in a Taylor series. u of x equals u of 0 plus u prime of 0 times x plus half u double prime of 0 x squared plus dot dot dot, where I chose my coordinates here so that the equilibrium point is at x equals 0. The first term, u of 0, is just a constant, and that doesn't matter. You're always allowed to change what you call the ground level of your potential energy function and shift this constant away. The second term, meanwhile, vanishes because we've chosen to expand around a minimum of the potential, where u prime is equal to 0. So typically, the first interesting term in the Taylor expansion of a potential around equilibrium is the quadratic term, which is just like the potential energy, 1 half kx squared, of a block on a spring. This is why systems oscillate back and forth around their equilibrium position. I'll put a link in the description to the video where I talked all about this. As for the force, that's related to the potential energy by f equals minus du by dx. And therefore, the Taylor series for the force on a particle near equilibrium starts with f equals minus u double prime of zero times x. Again, just like the spring force minus kx. In particular, the force is linear. So the trick I taught you a couple of weeks ago about the simple harmonic motion you discover when you expand the potential energy around a stable equilibrium is secretly the same thing as linearizing the f equals ma equation. Next up, let's look at the Newtonian limit of Einstein's theory of special relativity. In Newtonian mechanics, a free particle has kinetic energy 1 half mv squared. Alternatively, if we plug in the momentum p equals mv, we can write the same thing as p squared over 2m. This is the energy of a non-relativistic free particle with momentum p. Non-relativistic means that the particle isn't moving very fast compared to the speed of light. When particles do approach the speed of light, some weird and wild things happen that were discovered by Einstein a hundred and some years ago when he wrote down his special theory of relativity. In special relativity, the energy of a free particle of mass m and momentum p is given by this new formula, the square root of m squared c to the 4 plus p squared c squared, where c is the speed of light. You've seen this before even if you've never studied special relativity, because if the particle is at rest so that p equals 0, we get e equals mc squared, which might be the most famous equation in physics. But when the particle is moving, we need this more general formula, including the contribution from the momentum. This formula holds even if the speed of the particle approaches the speed of light. But on the other hand, we know what the energy is supposed to be when p is small. So how do we see that Einstein's formula correctly reproduces Newton's formula for a slow-moving particle? The idea is of course to apply the Taylor expansion of Einstein's energy when p is small. Let's first of all pull this factor of m squared c to the 4 outside the square root. Then we can write the whole thing like this. This makes it clear that what we want to do here is compute the Taylor series for f of x equals 1 plus x square root when x equals p squared over m squared c squared is small. Actually, this kind of Taylor series shows up so often in physics that it's worth writing down the slightly more general case for f of x equals 1 plus x to some power q. Our current case with the square root would be q equals half. I'll let you work out the first few terms of this Taylor series for yourself for practice. I also go through the details in the notes. I get f of x equals 1 plus qx plus half q q minus 1 times x squared. The first pair of terms here is again a very useful approximation that comes up a lot in physics. Now, back to the relativistic energy. We just plug in q equals half and x equals p squared over m squared c squared. Then here's what we get. And if we multiply through by the mc squared, here's where we end up. e equals mc squared plus p squared over 2m minus p to the 4 over 8m cubed c squared plus the higher powers of p. The first term is e equals mc squared again. That's what we get by evaluating the energy of a particle at rest in relativity. It doesn't have a direct analog in Newtonian mechanics, but on the other hand, it's just a constant, and you're always free to add a constant to the total energy in Newtonian mechanics without changing anything. As for the second term, there we see how the Taylor series reproduces precisely the kinetic energy that we expect in Newtonian mechanics. 
Actually, I'm being slightly sloppy here because the definition of the momentum P actually gets modified in relativity, and we should really tailor expand that as well. But in the non-relativistic limit, we of course get back the Newtonian momentum, P equals mv. But what about this next term in the Taylor series that goes like P to the 4? What are we supposed to make of that? The point is, Newtonian mechanics is a good description of the world for particles that aren't moving anywhere close to the speed of light. But it's only an approximation. This next term in the Taylor expansion is the leading relativistic correction to the Newtonian energy. When the speed is tiny compared to the speed of light, then this additional term gives a very small correction to Newton's result, and we can ignore it without losing much accuracy. But as the speed gets larger, this correction becomes increasingly important. One place we can see this correction in action is in the binding energy of a hydrogen atom. That's the amount of energy you would need to kick the electron out of its quote-unquote orbit around the proton at the center of the atom. In a video from a couple of months ago, I showed you how we can get 90% of the way to the answer for the binding energy just by applying dimensional analysis. In other words, by making a list of the parameters we have available to play with and their units, and seeing how we can combine them to get something with the units that we want. In this case, we saw that we can combine the electron mass m in kilograms, its electric charge e in coulombs, Coulomb's constant K, which sets the strength of the electric force, in Newton's meters squared per Coulomb squared, and Planck's constant H bar, which sets the scale of quantum mechanics, in kilograms meters squared per second, to get units of energy like so. Then the binding energy of the hydrogen atom must be proportional to this. Just by thinking about the units like this gets us almost all the way to the answer. The actual formula for the binding energy comes with a factor of half though, which we can't get by only thinking about the units, because 2 doesn't have any units. This is Bohr's formula for the binding energy of hydrogen, and it was one of the first great accomplishments of quantum mechanics. Its numerical value, about 13.6 electron volts, matches very closely to the experimental value of the binding energy. And yet, Bohr's formula is only an approximation. It neglects the small but fascinating and experimentally observable effects of special relativity. But where do we go wrong in our dimensional analysis argument? We wrote down the only possible way to combine m, e, k, and h bar to make units of energy. Well, it's not that we went wrong per se. It's that in writing down the non-relativistic approximation to the binding energy, we omitted the speed of light c from our list of parameters. So if we want to include the effects of special relativity, we need to consider how c can enter the formula for the energy. But something remarkable happens when we add c to the list of parameters. We can form a dimensionless combination by alpha equals ke squared over h bar c. This combination is called the fine structure constant. I'll leave it for you to check that all the dimensions really do cancel out here when you plug in the units. If you put in the numbers, you'll find that alpha is about 0 0.0073, or a little more memorably, about 1 divided by 137. Since alpha is unitless, dimensional analysis doesn't tell us anything about how it appears in the formula for the energy no more than it could tell us about the factor of 2 in the denominator. Any function of alpha can multiply our expression for the energy without spoiling the units. This is how relativity allows small corrections to Bohr's formula, which, remember, was itself already an excellent approximation to the experimental value of the hydrogen binding energy. But we can get an even better theoretical prediction by considering the relativistic corrections. With that leading relativistic correction that we derived by applying the Taylor series to Einstein's formula, we can determine the small modification that relativity makes to Bohr's formula. The details require quantum mechanics, so I won't go into that here. But the result is that this function f is given by 1, that was for the original Bohr answer, plus 5 fourths alpha squared. Remember that alpha is a tiny number, so this correction that goes like alpha squared is even tinier still. It's therefore called a fine structure correction to the energy. There are in fact further corrections to this formula, both at order alpha squared, as well as even smaller corrections at higher orders in alpha from various physical effects. Finally, while we're on the subject of quantum mechanics, let's finish by seeing how Taylor's formula is related to the definition of momentum in quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, the main question is to solve for the trajectory x of t of a particle as a function of time. In quantum mechanics, on the other hand, the goal is to find the wave function, psi of x, and how it evolves with time. Wherever the wave function, or rather its square, is bigger, the more likely you are to find the particle at that location when you make a measurement. Those things that we measure about the particle, like its position and momentum, are represented by operators that act on the wave function, 
we write x hat for the operator that measures the position and p hat for the operator that measures the momentum. The point of this video isn't to learn quantum mechanics right now, but I gave you a bit of a crash course in the video I posted about symmetries in quantum mechanics that I'll link in the description if you want to see more. I told you there about how the momentum operator is closely related to translations in space. So let's define an operator, call it u of epsilon, that shifts the wave function over by epsilon. If you haven't seen those earlier videos where I explained more about what all this means, don't sweat it right now. We'll just take this as a definition and discover how it's related to Taylor's formula. And indeed, this looks familiar. Physics aside, psi of x is just a function. And this formula tells us that we're looking for an operator that shifts psi of x over to psi of x minus epsilon. And that's exactly what Taylor's formula does. Therefore, we identify the translation operator u with e to the minus epsilon d by dx. For reasons we won't delve into right now, this translation operator u is related to the momentum operator by u of epsilon equals e to the minus i over h bar epsilon times p. Then comparing the two sides, Taylor's formula shows us that we should identify the momentum operator in quantum mechanics with p equals h bar over i d by dx. When you do start studying quantum mechanics, this will be one of the first formulas you'll learn. It follows directly from Taylor's formula. This has been just a small selection of physics applications where Taylor's formula shows up. But again, you'd really be hard pressed to find any chapter of any physics textbook where it isn't applied. Keep your eyes open and you'll see Taylor's formula everywhere. You can find the notes for this video, as well as links to all the earlier videos that I mentioned down in the description. If you like the video and you want to help support the channel, I'll also put a link to my Patreon page. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you back here soon for another physics lesson.